Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Jim Kondos. I'm the Secretary of State. With me is our Deputy Secretary, uh, Chris Winters. And Adele, I think, wants to quickly say something. Okay. I was thinking, oh, I'm off the hook. <laughs> Come on. I have, I mean, all I'm going to do is welcome you for coming, welcome you for coming out in this, like, wonderful weather we have tonight so i'm glad some people showed up i just wanted to uh, remind you that we do have some things going on during the month of december here at the athenaeum and i'm not going to go through the long list right now but it will help you start out your holiday and all you have to do is go to our website www.stjathenaeum.org uh, and we'll have all the things listed for adults and kids there um, and I do want to offer a warm welcome to Jim Condes, the Secretary of State for Vermont. And I would like for you to please welcome me, welcome, join me in welcoming the Secretary of State. Thank you. So uh, this presentation is gonna be split up into three sections. It's gonna be, the first section is gonna be about defending our democracy, it's specifically about cybersecurity and what we're doing to protect our elections. The second part will be about the open meeting law. The third part will be about public records access. So we'll get started. So cybersecurity is like a race without a finish line. So we started at the Secretary of State's office uh, working on our, focusing on our cybersecurity back in 2013. And it's not just for elections, but we were actually doing it for all of the uh, divisions that we oversee. Um, and then in August of 2016, the Department of Homeland Security called all the secretaries of state across the country to a conference call uh, and informed us that they had at least 21 states that are, were being attacked. Uh, and this is something that all the U.S. intelligence agencies agreed upon. There was one state that was breached. That was the state of Illinois. Uh, and what was breached was actually their voter registration database. Nothing happened to it. They just left telltale signs that the Russians had been there. Uh, it wasn't until much later that year before we knew that it was the Russians that had attacked us. Uh, Vermont, again, was ahead of the game. We had, as I said, we had started focusing on cybersecurity back in 2013. So, we have a robust suite of defenses, and if we were to tell you everything, including all the details, we would have to send it to the Russians. Uh, at the Kremlin. So we don't tell you what it is, but we, we can assure you that we have a robust suite of defenses. We'll get into some of the stuff generically. Uh, we've actually divided up into four sections. It's warm up here. Uh, we divided up into four sections, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Under the uh, button for protect, New, we put a new election management system, uh, the town clerks know it as VEMS, um, which stands for Election Management, Vermont Election Management System. It was built and, and put into place in 2015. And with new systems, and this is, this is a key, with new systems comes added security that we build into it. And we actually included it right in the RFP from the very beginning. We also had two-factor authentication for every individual who has access. It's much like what you do with a bank, uh, online banking. Uh, we have web application firewalls in front of all the doors to our systems, and we secure, have secure the human trainings for our town clerks and staff. Under detect, we are constantly monitoring all of these systems. Uh, we have all, we do, we complete on an annual basis vulnerability and risk assessment. We also, since 2016, prior to the November election, we've been doing weekly uh, Homeland Security cyber hygiene scans. And really it's like a, a, a doctor's visit for uh, a physical or a checkup. Um, and what they do is they scan our system from remotely and then tell us if they found any open doors or if it was any weak spots that they were, were able to detect. And we do annual penetration testing where we actually hire uh, good guys to try to get into our system and, and tell us what they found. Under respond, 
this is something that we recommend as a best practice for all states uh, is to have an incident response plan in place. We worked with the Harvard Belfer Center, with the Department of Homeland Security, and a, a group called the Center for Internet Security to develop our incident response plan. And basically, you want to have that in place before you get breached or attacked. I mean, and you, you'll appreciate that, my next comment. If it's a computer, it can be hacked. And you just have to hope that you've got all the defenses in place. Um, we have strong communication channels now that we didn't have before. So prior to 2016, we really had no communication with our federal partners. We now have strong communication channels that are open. Uh, and, we, and we work plan, doing some planning with, with our partners as well. And you want to have that in place before you actually, uh, uh, before anything actually happens. We've participated in several tabletop exercises. Uh, I know my elections team has been down to uh, uh, Harvard in Boston to, uh, for two events. Uh, we also had a, another one that we've done uh, at one of our conferences. Um, and these tabletop exercises, they, they, sh they throw at us worst case scenarios and how do you respond to it. And it's just kind of trying to get you in, in tune with what you need to do. We have internal threat mitigation measures in place to limit the amount of damage that a bad guy can do. Uh, and we hope that we never have to uh, use those. And recently, uh, in June, we went to a regional New, uh, North New England meeting with Department of Homeland Security, CISOV, FBI, and Secret Service. It was held at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and, and we actually um, were there for uh, a, a good day, and uh, uh, we had threat, we, we received threat, uh, how do I want to call it, important threat uh, dashboard information as to what, the, what they're seeing out there, uh, and also did some uh, uh, quick tabletop stuff. Jim, what's CISA? CISA? CISA is, is uh, actually right there, is Cyber security, let me think here, C not Cyber Intelligence Security Administration. It's a new division that's been formed under the Department of Homeland Security. And that's their focus, is their main focus. We also work with a group called CIS, which is Center for Net Internet Security as well. They're out of the Albany area, but they're under contract to Homeland Security. Recover is the next button. We have built-in res resiliencies. We, of course, here in Vermont, we have the ultimate unhackable uh, solution, and that is paper ballots. Uh, so we have paper ballots, uh, and we have post-election audits that we do uh, uh, on a statewide basis. Uh, and then we also, we do a daily backup of our voter registration system. So if, if a bad guy were to get into our system, we would only have to go back 24 hours to reset it. We'd only lose 24 hours worth of data. And then on top of that, we have same day voter registration, meaning no eligible vo voter would be turned away. So protecting the integrity of every vote that's cast. Our decentralized structure, and this is true across the country, is a security feature. Because we're, we're not all linked together or anything like that, uh, that helps us to, to defend uh, against any uh, widespread attack. Um, trying to alter any Vermont elections would be re really difficult. For the towns that use optical scanners, uh, they still are reading a voter marked paper ballot. We only have 54% of the towns that actually use tabulators. The rest of the towns are hand count. But those 54% of the towns, about 135 out of the 246, represent about 80% of the vote. The tabulators, the towns that have tabulators, those tabulators are not connected to the internet in any way. They're air gapped. Uh, they're not connected by Wi-Fi, hardwire, or remote access. Uh, the, the clerks have a, a strict chain of custody uh, for their tabulator memory cards and their equipment, and they do a routine test of, of the logic and accuracy before they use it. So continuing on working with our state and federal partners, our relationship has obviously improved over the last three years. As I said, prior to 2016, 
we had no relationship really. Uh, we're now members of the EI ISAC, which is an election infrastructure, election infrastructure information sharing analysis center. That's when uh, election infrastructure was designated as a critical infrastructure by the federal government. Uh, we set up this election infrastructure ISAC. Uh, it's really an information tool. Uh, the MS ISAC is something that all 50 states are part of. The EI ISAC, we, when it was first set up in 2018, um, we actually set it up and it was the fastest setup of an ISAC that they had at that time. Um, all 50 states, I think five territories, and as of the, today, about 2,300 counties and, and uh, locals are, are members of it. Uh, there's regular collaboration on cybersecurity matters. As I said, the communication channels are, are really open. Um, and we have what is now called an election day threat dashboard that, the, that our office is connected to the other 50 states so that if we see something, if, if we see something, we can announce it on this dashboard or if someone else in Portland, Oregon finds something going on, they can notify through this dashboard and it gets to all 50 states. Um, just to give you an aside, um, back in August of 2018, uh, last year, um, my IT manager came to me and said, uh, he, he showed me some logs from the, from the web application firewalls. And one of the logs that he was showing me showed several instances where it said country of origin, Russia. So we turned around, he called the, the EI ISAC and, and um, Center for Internet Security. I called the, set, uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security and within 24 to 36 hours, an alert went out to all 50 states to let them know to be on the lookout for this particular set of uh, IP addresses. Um, it's something that we wouldn't been, have been able to do prior to 2016. What do we see as the biggest problem coming up? information, misinformation and disinformation, usually on social media. So what's happened is, and I, you know, I can say clearly that, that if someone wanted to try to change votes, the Russians have figured out they can't change the votes. So if they wanted to change the votes though, what they, here's what they would have to do. Break into the town hall, break into the town clerk's office, break into the town vault, find the memory cards, reconfigure them, and get out before anybody noticed it. And they would only get a few, few votes out of that. They couldn't really impact a, a large number of votes. So they'd have to have an army of people doing that across the state and across the country. Uh, and it just isn't gonna happen. What we're seeing now as the biggest influence is social media, Facebook and Twitter, things like that. Um, where they're trying to influence us to either suppress the vote or make you think somebody's a bad guy or somebody's a good guy. Um, the intelligence agencies all agree that the foreign adversaries are trying to divide us, they're trying to sow chaos, and they're tr they're, they are very active on social media. So what we are trying to tell people is to look to trusted sources. Go to your town clerk, go to, your, to our office, uh, and, and make sure that you're getting correct information before you link and send something else out somewhere else. We also, when I was the president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, we worked with Twitter and Facebook uh, to develop web portals that, that each state is connected to so that we can, if we see something on Facebook or Twitter that is clearly misinformation, we can notify them and they can take it down. The problem is, and just keep this in mind, the problem is that with Facebook or Twitter, you put something posted on it, and it could be hundreds of thousands of people see it in a very short period of time. So that's the end of the cybersecurity piece of it. Does anybody have any questions on that part? I'm just curious as to, with all the good ones, it's in there, if it's acting that way, but what about Registering to vote that shouldn't be registered to vote. It shouldn't be allowed to vote. 
So that's, a, that's an issue. We don't have any say in that technically. That's up to the Board of Civil Authority of the town. And they are the I'm ones. I'm talking about the town. I'm talking about the state. Burlington wants people to vote that aren't citizens. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a completely different issue that, that will be taken up. First of all, they have to, their council has to approve something like that. It would have to go to the vote of the people, and if it approved by the vote of the people, it would go to the legislature. If it's approved by the legislature, it would go to the governor before something like that could pass. Keep in mind, and I'm not defending you know, non-citizens voting, but prior to 1920s, non-citizens voted in America. Oh, I'm sure they did. Did you be correct in that? And that would only be for local elections. The constant, it doesn't matter. The U.S. Well, no, but the U.S. Constitution and the Vermont Constitution and statutes do not allow exactly. uh, non-citizens to vote in state or federal elections. Exactly. So, any of the any of the town like Montpelier has passed it, but they, the legislature didn't pass it this past year. Um, so Montpelier passed non-citizen voting. Burlington is looking at doing it. Winooski is looking at doing it. Um, those towns that do do it will have to keep a separate checklist. They will not be able to use the state checklist for that. They're going to have to maintain their own checklist. Are there any other questions? All right, we'll get going on the transparency side. So why are we here? We're here because of democracy, accountability, and openness. The public has a right to know. Open meeting and public records laws protect us from our direct access, or to our direct access of the decisions that affect us. And understanding the laws make everyone a better citizen. The Vermont Constitution, Chapter 1, Article 6, says that all power being originally inherent in and consequently derived from the people, therefore all officers of government, whether legislative or executive, are their trustees and servants, and at all times in a legal way are accountable to them. So these are the two public policy statements that are out there. The first one is this 311. This is the Declaration of Public Policy for the Open Meeting Law, and essentially it says the public commissions, boards, and councils, and other public agencies in the state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business and are accountable to them. And this 315 is the statement of policy for public records access. And it, it just basically says that the public has a right to free and open examination of records, that officers of government are trustees and servants of the people, and it is in the public's interest to enable any person to review and criticize their decisions, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment. And you'll see this again later on. So we're going to talk about open meetings first. Can I ask one question? Sure. Back to this uh, free and open examination of records. Yep. Does that mean you could go to the, your town clerk's office and examine records and not get, have to be charged for it? If you're only looking to inspect, yes, with the exception of land records. Land records have their own set of fees already in statute. Say they're births and deaths records. Pardon? Say they're you're looking at births and deaths. Uh, the, the, that also has specific uh, fees that are charged. That's, that's separate, it's, it's written into the law itself, into the statutes for that. It's the same thing with the police departments, can charge, I don't know, 35 or $40 for a video to get a copy of a video. There are fees that are charged for copies and things like that if you wanna take a copy with you. But if you wanna just inspect, you're allowed to, because of the recent court decision, Supreme Court decision, you're allowed to do that free of charge. To inspect? To inspect. Don't take any no. Okay. Yes? On that same question, I had a colleague that's experienced this. Went to inspect records, took a cell phone photo, and charged them. Is that still cool? <laughs> that is still cool. Uh, it, to, no, not to be charged for it. I'm sorry. Not to yeah. be charged for it. So that was exactly. The decision, the, the decision of the court was talking about a video, but they re referenced that whole issue. So it's, it's essentially, there's two pieces to this. One is, are you, did you want to inspect a record? And if you are, you, you don't get charged for 
any redacting or anything like that. The second part of it is if there's a charge, uh, it has to be an actual cost. My response is when I whip out this phone, take a picture of an email, what's the cost to the, to the town or the state for my taking a picture of it? So the legislature passed a law, now it says that they can't charge us if we take a cell phone. They did not pass a law. That's inherent in the law that exists already. So they can't charge you? No, they can't charge you. Okay, so it's already in the law? It's already in the law. It's, it's been all over the place. There's never been a court case until just recently. I mean, we asked the statistics about that. We told about some public officials that don't know the law says that we can charge you. That's why I was asking. Not, I came up yeah, to not, if, if someone wants to take a picture of, of a record, of a public record, there should be no charge to it, except, as I said, uh, for land records, for vital records, uh, because those have separate fees that are already in, inherent within the law. And they don't charge the courthouse, but they do charge. So the court, here's the thing. <laughs> Um, there, was a little, there was a little dust up a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Uh, uh, the Attorney General put out a, a directive that said that there was going to be a charge. If you ask to inspect records and then you whipped out your phone to take a picture of it, you're going to have to pay for uh, the cost of preparing that document for you to look at it. Unbeknownst to me, the governor said no, I said no. The, the courts actually have a directive written in 2015 that says if someone takes out their own device and takes a picture of it, it's free of charge. Yeah, I would say that uh, you know, I want to be a good environmentalist, a good steward of society. If you're going to make, make paper, I think that's a bad ecological environmental policy. That's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. That's good, huh? Very good. That's good. Jenny, yes. I to this lady, uh, for a free and open examination, as long as there's no copies, but there are vault fees. Yeah, uh, so no, that, there are vault fees. fees. That's why I said with land records, because land records have, um, there's a whole set, it's, it's, a, it's like a page of, of fees that are charged and, and that are set up in the statute. But didn't the Attorney General make the argument that the cost of time of redacting and uh, stuff could be charged? That's what he was, if, if you're asking for a copy of a record, then he, you can get charged for the cost of, of redacting and, and searching for those records. If you are not, if you're just asked to inspect them, the courts are, are just, they just decided this, like what, a month ago, six yeah, weeks? Right. It was just a few months ago, it was the Doyle case. Uh, against the city of Burlington, and, and uh, they, they said that there was no charge if you're inspecting. That's what the law says. So they can't, just because you're going to take a picture of it, you can't now start charging for. Sensitive information. Well, redact. They still have to redact any information that's not public. Okay. They have to go through and do that. Can you charge for that or not? They cannot charge for that unless you're requesting a copy, unless you're requesting them to provide you a copy. So who must comply with the open meeting law? Public bodies. Public bodies are the state of the state and its municipalities. That includes state and municipal boards, councils, and commissions, and any committees or subcommittees of those bodies. Uh, not included are the actual individual officials, are any councils established by the governor for policy advice, the judicial branch, public service board, and generally nonprofits. And we say generally because for nonprofit, they could be 100% funded by the state, but it, if, if the state doesn't say in that funding stream that they must follow the open meeting law, or the nonprofit's bylaws don't say they have to follow the open meeting law, then they wouldn't. Um, Vermont Public Television found out the hard way. Uh, they, they were not following the open meeting law. This is a few years ago, and uh, uh, they didn't think they had to because they said we're a nonprofit and we receive funding from a lot of different sources. And then it was found that the Center for Public Broadcasting, which provides a large chunk of money to them in the funding stream, says you must follow the open meeting law of your state. So that's why we say generally with nonprofits, it depends.
Just to clarify, private nonprofits that receive no public money? It depends on what their bylaws say. So say their bylaws don't say anything. Then, then they don't have to follow it. And when does the open meeting law apply? Anytime you have a quorum holding a meeting. What is a quorum? A quorum is a majority of the entire body. So if you have a three member select board, it'd be two. Five member would be three. Seven member would be four. A nine member would be five. Uh, and a meeting is a gathering of a quorum of a public body for the purpose of discussing business or taking action. And what is discussing business? It's the business of the public body that anything that they have responsibility for. So if, if you had a three member select board and they're all standing on the sidelines at the soccer game at, at the grade school watching the game and they start talking, as long as they're talking about the Red Sox or the Giants or New England Patriots or whatever, they're fine. But the minute they start talking about the budget or start talking about the highway department or, or whatever, now you're talking about the business and that would be an illegal meeting at that point. When does it also apply? So a meeting can occur regardless of where the location is. As I said, you could be on the side of the uh, soccer field, you could be at the coffee house, or you could be at town hall. Um, and you can have a meeting that comes together over a span of time. Specifically, watch out for email strings um, and social media discussions. We've had several occasions where uh, some of the some folks, some commissions or committees want to actually have like a chat room and have discussions and you, that's really not allowed uh, unless uh, because the public overall doesn't either know about it, can't participate in it. Um, so it, you have to really be careful. A meeting does not include communications to schedule a meeting, to organize an agenda, or distribute the materials to discuss at a meeting. So if, if a select board was gonna meet and their town administrator or the town clerk was gonna send them a bunch of documents, perfectly fine. Or, or sends out an email and says, can we meet on Monday at three o'clock? That's fine. But if you start hitting reply all and then everybody starts discussing those, doc those documents that you've sent, that's where you start running into trouble. Um, it also doesn't apply to clerical work and staff, staff work assignments, routine day-to-day -day administrative matters if no action is required, uh, site inspections to assess damage or make tax assessments, uh, or quasi-judicial deliberations such as you would have on a zoning board. And the reason for that is because you have a written decision that's issued after. So what types of meetings are there? We have a regular meeting, which is when the select board uh, organizes for the start of the year uh, after the election. Uh, they set their regular time and place. Um, you need to post and make an agenda available 48 hours before each meeting. A special meeting, if, if, the, if you say that you're gonna meet first Monday of each month at 7 p.m. at the town hall, and none of that changes you don't have to you have to post an agenda but you don't have to post a warning but if you're going to change any of those three if you're going to say instead of the first monday it's a holiday and you're going to meet on the on tuesday then you would have to give 24 hours notice of where you're going to meet why you're going to meet and, and uh, uh, what time you're going to meet um, if you have a newspaper or radio station serving that area then you must notify them and any person who has specifically asked in writing. So the way it works is if someone between January and November sends you an email, a letter, and says, I wanna be notified of any special meeting during the year, it's that they only have to do it once and it's good for that calendar year. If you do it in December, it's good for the rest of that calendar year and the next calendar year. And emergency meetings should only be used when necessary to respond to unforeseen occurrences or conditions requiring immediate attention. And you must give some public notice as soon as possible. So on emergency meetings, it's not about, oh, we forgot to sign some documents on Monday night, we're gonna 
we'll call an emergency meeting on Friday. That would be a special meeting because you can still give yourself 24 hours notice. Emergency meetings are really, well, the, the, I think the easiest way for me to say it is uh, go back to September of 2011. And what did we have? Hurricane Irene hit us and we had emergency meetings going on all over the state. You had select boards meeting with their public works department to figure out what are we gonna do about this washout here, that bridge over there, the culvert over there. And uh, so people were moving fast to try to overcome those issues. That's what it would be classified as an emergency meeting. Any questions before I move on? So agendas, you must put, uh, notice an agenda 48 hours before each regular meeting, 24 hours before each special meeting. If the town maintains a website, they must also post it on the website. Uh, if they don't, they don't have to. Uh, municipal public bodies only should also post it in the town clerk's office and in at least two other designated public places. Typically, that would be a school, the town hall, of course, or, or the town clerk's office, a school, a store, uh, or some other designated place. And it should be the same place every time. Um, and then you must make it available to anybody that asks for it uh, uh, by specific request. Um, also, you should address the specific topics that will be discussed in any potential actions. And any addition or deletion to the agenda must be the first act of business for that meeting. And any other adjustment can be made during the meeting. So if you had uh, item number three was you're gonna receive a report from regional planning. Um, and they aren't there yet. They're gonna be there by eight o'clock, but they don't show up right away. You can delay that without any problem. The addition or deletion, that one you want to be careful about because it should not, if you add something to the agenda, it should not be for action in that meeting. So it should be for information purposes only because we, frankly, what, what, the, the, what the legislature talked about was the problems where a board could say, okay, we've got nobody here tonight from the public. We'll add some controversial items that we can just go ahead and pass. And that's what you want to avoid. Minutes. Minutes must give a true indication of the business of the meeting covering all topics and motions. At a minimum, really all that's required is that which members were present, were there any active participants? What are the motions, proposals, or resolutions, and what occurred? Uh, and if there was a roll call, what were the individual votes for the roll call? They are, this part has not changed in over 30 years. They must be ready within five calendar days. They don't have to be the final minutes, but they have to be at least a draft set of minutes. Um, the statutes do not recognize whether it's draft or approved. Uh, so. It's not like you have to have an approval within five calendar days. And where you must make them available for inspection at the town clerk's office. Uh, and and they, if you have a website, they must be posted to the website. A few years ago when the legislature made a change, this was the one that created all the, all the uproar about posting to a website. But this part was the same for the last 30 plus years. So that didn't change at all. Executive session, what is it? It's the closed portion of the meeting. When's it appropriate? Only if the business can, to be considered fits into one of 14 different uh, categories. And only, you have to be in an open meeting first before you can go into executive session. So the meeting has to be an official meeting and you would have a motion to go into executive session explaining what the reason is for going in and that's all you can talk about. Um, you can only talk, no action, unless you're dealing with real estate, which is the only item that you can actually vote on in, in a uh, executive session. So what are the uh, items? Uh, these are the categories. So if you have to, so the first uh, six of them are contracts, labor relation agreements, arbitration, mediation, grievances, civil litigation or pro, uh, prosecution and confidential attorney client communications. 
And for those, you do need to have, you got to, uh, you should state that premature public knowledge would place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. Going into the second half of these, it's again, real estate purchase options, which is the only thing you can vote on in an executive session. Then appointment, employment, evaluation, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee. Um, this one gets a lot of, th this can get a lot of uh, questions <coughs> at times because let's say you're gonna fire an employee. You can't fire the employee in executive session. You can discuss it, but you have to come out and have a motion publicly to do it. Uh, student academic records, suspension or discipline to discuss the public records and, and are there any exemptions uh, uh, for a specific request, public safety, clear and imminent peril. And this one was added at the last, uh, the last couple of years, municipal or school security or emergency response measures, because you really don't want to give the bad guys what your plans are. So public participation, Members of the public have a right to attend. They have a right to obtain meeting agendas in advance. They have a right to be notified directly of special meetings, and you must supply disability accommodations if necessary. They have a right to participate. This actually came out of a uh, court decision, a reasonable opportunity to express opinions on matters being considered. So you have to give people a chance. And let me, I always use this as an example. When I was a city council chair in the city of South Burlington, uh, we, had, uh, we had a $10 million operating budget. Two people would show up for our public hearing, just two. And they wouldn't say anything, they'd just be there to listen to us. Then maybe the week later, two weeks later, we'd have another meeting and we were gonna discuss whether we should extend the leash law to the bike path. And we had 150 people show up. It wasn't gonna cost anybody any money, but 150 people would show up. And it'd be pretty evenly distributed between 75 for it, 75 against it. And everybody wanted to say something. So we had a sign up sheet. And that sign-up sheet is what we eventually put with our minutes to say these are the people that participated in the meeting. Um, and um, everybody, I, I allowed everybody to speak for two minutes. And it was a late night, a very late night. So why comply? Because meetings held without respect to the details of the law could be considered illegal. And if so, the courts could regard any actions that, they t that you may have taken in those meetings as voidable. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. And, and the court, although I don't recall any time where there's been an actual charge raised at, at, a, at the courts for that, but that's essentially what they're saying. So why comply? The persons, the following people can be charged with a misdemeanor and fined. If a member of the public body, so a member of the select board, for instance, knowingly and intentionally violated the open meeting law, or a person who knowingly, any other person who knowingly and intentionally violates the open meeting law on behalf of a member of the public body, or a person who knowingly and intentionally participates in the wrongful exclusion of a person from a meeting. Um, so what can be done? So the attorney, you can file an agreement with with the Attorney General, complain with the Attorney General, or you can bring suit in court asking for injunctive relief, declaratory judgment, or and or attorney's fees if you win. Enforcement, pretty simple. Uh, you must provide a written notice to the public body if you think that the public body has violated the open meeting law. The public body then has 10 calendar, calendar days to either acknowledge that they violated the law of the open meeting law and what their intent is to cure it, or for them to stay, say that there was no violation that occurred, so no cure is necessary. If the public body does say that they're gonna cure it, um, they have 14 days, 14 calendar days to actually uh, respond and, and declare uh, the void any action that they had taken and then adopt specific measures that actually prevent future violations. 
Um, we had one town um, in central Vermont that uh, actually was required by the court to have us and DLCT provide them two trainings on, on the open meeting law. What time uh, was that? Um, what was that? Granville. Granville, I think. Um, uh, an agreed, uh, uh, the individual's recourse, if, if you're unsatisfied, let's say the public body says, no, we didn't violate the, uh, the open meeting law, and, and you say, well, I think you did, and I'm gonna take you to court. So you have one year after that meeting to actually go to court and file a, a, a litigation there. So that's the end of the open meeting law. Is there any questions before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Were you in the, Were you in the auditorium that that year? Because we had 165 people show up. Probably. Oh, <laughs> 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 this was at the select board. Yeah. It was an elderly gentleman. I guess usually went to the knees, and he had missed a few. And the gentleman that was acting as select board member. Elderly gentleman asked a question about something. He said, Well, so and so, if, if you would come to the meeting, I wouldn't have to do this. You, you would know. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if he got around to answering the question or not, but he should have had to answer it if he did. He should, absolutely should have. Um, just because someone didn't come to a previous meeting doesn't mean you, you ignore them. Uh, and, and, you know, we had another uh, situation down. I can't remember where, it was Southwest Vermont, uh, like near Bennington, or might have even been Bennington, where um, a member of the public and the select board member got into a pretty caustic and loud argument. And it was going back and forth. And all of a sudden the select board chair yelled at the public access TV and said, shut that camera off, this is embarrassing. And the person on the camera was brand new, shut it off. So the, the, the newspaper down there called us and wanted to know if that was the right thing to do. And we said, no, it's not. And uh, um, just because, and, and there was that statement up front that so talked about embarrassment. You, you, you can't shut things down just because you're gonna be embarrassed by something that's being done. So, pardon? No, I no. In that case, no, because the public has a right to take a picture, whether it's using your cell phone and taking a video or a camera in the back of the room. You just can't. You can't um, intrude or be a burden to the select board or whatever board it is. You just you, you can't. You can't be a burden on them. But there's nothing that says you can't, you know, take a picture or, or a video of uh, a, a public body. Would that apply to like an Act 250 commission? Uh, that would probably fall under judicial. So I don't know if that. I, I think that they have their own sets of rules that they follow. All right, so moving on to public records. Um, what is a public record? It's any written or recorded information, regardless of the physical form or characteristics that are produced or acquired in the course of an agency business. Um, not limited to just paper. It could be, you know, on a thumb drive. It could be on a disk. It could be whatever format that they come in. Um, all government, and I, I must say this, all government records are considered public records. Some public records have exemptions to prevent disclosure. So things like your social security number, health uh, information, medical information, uh, uh, personal ID and other personal ID information, those are all restricted um, and should not be prevented. So there also is, um, so who can, has to comply, again, public agencies, state and municipal agencies, boards, departments, commissions, committees, branches, instrumentalities, and authorities. Um, and again, nonprofits are generally not included unless it's, it's written into their bylaws. 
So who can ask to inspect or copy a record? Anybody. And this was actually a court decision, Schlansky versus the city of Burlington and the Burlington PD back in 2010. The identity and motive of a requester cannot be considered when weighing access to the public documents. So you can, if someone comes in and says, I want these documents, you can't say, what do you want them for? Who are you? It's a member of the public. They get their act, they have access. How do you make a request? Well, if you're at, if it's state records you're asking, you can go in a state office and ask uh, between, on weekdays, between nine and 12 and one and four. And if it's municipal records, during the customary business hours, whenever that office is open. So you can't require the town clerk to come in on her off day or whatever. So some of our, we have town clerks that are open five days a week, four, three, two, one, some even at half a day. So you can't require someone to come in on their off time to meet the request. What do we, although you're not, there is no in writing requirement for public records requests, we re think it's a good idea uh, because you're able to list specifically what you're looking for. You can specifically say whether you want to inspect them or copy them. Uh, and uh, again, there's no charge to inspect. And if you ask for copies, you could get an estimate, you could request an estimate of how much it's, is it going to cost if you want copies of those records. Uh, and that way you can also date your record, your request, and put your contact info on. So how do you, how do you comply for public records access? Promptly means produce the record for inspection. Promptly means immediately with little or no delay and unless otherwise provided, not more than three business days. Uh, and often three business days is cited because it wants to give you time if you need to check, if you need to go find the record or if you need to check with uh, uh, your attorney or, or somebody else about whether, where the record is or whatever. You can accept the rec request in any manner or format. It could be over the phone, it could be by email, it could be in writing. Um, and if it's necessary, the, the government agency is allowed to ask the requester to narrow their scope. So if someone said, I want all emails between uh, the, the select board chair and the public works department for the month of the year of 2019, um, you, you are allowed to ask the question, what exactly are you looking for? Because if we can narrow that request down, we might be able to get it to you quicker and less cost to us and to you. Exemptions under the statute. So if there is, the, the, the custodian of the record must make a determination and promptly notify the requester in writing if they're not going to allow the record to be shown uh, if, if it's considered exempt from statute. So you must do it in writing that, and that notice must say what the identity of the records are that are withheld, what's the statutory basis for the denial, what are the supporting facts for the denial, and the names and person, uh, positions of the persons responsible for making the denial. And you also have to include language that says Here's who you can appeal to. If the record does not exist, the custodian must promptly certify in writing that it does not exist under the name given or the, by the requester or any other no, name known to the custodian. If there are unusual circumstances, you can, have, you can ask for up to 10 business days uh, to search for and collect records from remote facilities. Town clerk vaults are not the biggest place to store records, so sometimes they don't have all their records there. They might have them someplace else. So they might have to go look for them. Um, if, if you have to search for or examine a large volume of separate distinct records, uh, you, and again, you can ask to narrow the scope. And if you have to check with another agency, like maybe the, someone goes into the town clerk's office and they want some records, but the town clerk says, well, they're not my records, I don't have them, let me check with the public works department. 
Uh, and you, again, you must, the custodian must give written notice to a requester stating the reason for the extension and the expected date of compliance. So in making a determination, the rule says that the public agencies must produce public records for inspection and copying unless the record is exempt from st under statute. The policy states it's in the public interest to enable any person to review and criticize government decisions, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment. The burden of proof for the Public Records Act actually First of all, it represents a strong policy favoring access to public records. But in a court decision in 2004, Wesco versus Sorrell, they wrote, we construe these exceptions strictly against the custodians of the records and will resolve any doubts in favor of disclosure. Basically, that's saying if it's, if it's a close area or a gray area, we're gonna fall to the side of disclosure. And they stated that the burden of proof is on the agency seeking to avoid disclosure, not on the person asking for the records. So where are the exemptions? Well, the first 40 of them are listed in the Public Records Act, which is in, in 1 VSA 317. And then there are approximately 200 to 220 scattered throughout the Green Books, throughout the statutes. Uh, there are two sources, two places to go. In, on the legislative website, there is, whoops, boom. On the legislative uh, council uh, button, there's a list of uh, public records exemptions. They update this every year, and we also do, we, we've been doing this for many years. The legislative council has only started to do this probably in the last five years, I think, something like that. The Secretary of State's office has been providing this right to know database. And you can actually go in and say, um, medical records or, or medical exemptions and it'll pull up any exemption that is uh, has medical uh, atta attached to it uh, it's always a good idea for the public agencies to know and maintain the, uh, a compilation of the specific uh, laws that affect them so every state agency every municipal government has specific ideas or specific laws that affect them you should know what they are. Um, what if only part of the record is exempt? So there used to be a time in Vermont where if let's say you had a three page document that you were requesting and it had on the very top line of the first page a, a social security number, it used to be that they would say, sorry, you can't have this document because it's got an exempt information on it. Now what the legislature did was they said you must redact the information that's exempt but still provide the rest of the document. And I think a common area for, for folks in the media is police reports. You get a lot of black lines on police reports. Uh, I should have a question, because it gets to all of this. So one of the exemptions for, say, a police radio log is open. You can ask for their radio logs, which is where they went and what time, you know, what you would call an important time. Uh, and then there's an investigation. Well, we can't you know, give you information about an investigation. I had a situation where a police chief in one agency said he wasn't going to give me radio logs uh, for a particular house because the, another agency was conducting an investigation. Not the same, not asking about the investigation, not asking about the other agency, but to a different agency and said, I want to see your radio logs and when you respond to this house. They go, oh no, I can't, they're, they're, they're being investigated by someone else. Is that an exemption? Uh, we don't we don't get into the specific exemptions generally uh, because we just can't we couldn't keep track of them all ourselves um, and and typically you you might have to it's up to the agency to to defend the exemption that they're that their requests are demanding uh, right but this agency was saying that their exemption was because another agency was investigating and that's possible I think what you'd want to do is put in writing what you're asking for and make them respond in writing, citing the exemption. There's a whole bunch of different law enforcement and investigation. And they just changed, the law enforcement ones just changed in the last couple of years. Yep. The legislature just changed them. Doesn't sound right just hearing what you're saying, but you know, I don't see It seemed odd at the time. Yeah. Well, and then one of the, one of the things is whether, sometimes you have um, cross-agency or interagency uh, discussions that have to have, have to have be 
be, that have to occur because you don't know. It might be fine in one agency, but the other agency might say, no, that's, that's exempt information. In this case, you're dealing with an official who was a member of one agency who left and went to a second agency. And I asked that guy if you have a job. He's like, oh, no, no, no. He has to it's respond. Like, so, so the thing is, he has to respond in writing. It's a good idea. No, it's not a good idea. It's a lie. He has to respond in writing if he's <laughs> denying you. <laughs> and you can tell him that. <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> So does a, does a government agency have to uh, gather new information or create new documents in response to a request? Simple answer, no. A requester cannot obligate the government to create a record that is not already in existence. So for instance, ah, let's see, if, if and I, I'm just trying to see. So I can, you could request a document that has some of the parameters that you're looking for and then there might be another document that has other pieces of it that you want, but you can't request them to, to make a new document that creates both, that merges them. I think that's a simple way to do it. The other way, the other thing is that must I withhold a document if the exemption applies? And again, it, it depends. Uh, it, it may require that you withhold that document, that entire document. It depends on what the law says. And, the, and it might not just be Vermont law, it could be federal law too. Um, it's always, the safest course is always to err on the side of openness, and sometimes you have to consult your legal counsel. <laughs> so why comply? An agency that denies access to non-exempt public records may face litigation and could be charged the requester's court costs. That was changed um, probably around 2000, 14 or 13 uh, by the legislature. They basically changed one word, may to shall. So if someone requests documents and the government agency says no, and you go to court and the court says, give the documents, and by the way, while you're at it, pay the court costs, the legal fees for that requester. Um, whereas before it used to be May and in something like 40 years they only had about three times where the court actually issued a uh, uh, attorney's fees. So from how, how do you appeal? So you appeal to the head of the agency and at that point the head of the agency has five business days to either make the records available to provide a notice of denial in writing, including the statutory basis, reasoning and supporting facts, and details about your appeal rights. If the denial is upheld and there is no head of agency, you can file an appeal in court and you generally have a 30-day deadline from the date of denial. So that's the end of the public records and essentially that's the end of our presentation. Are there any questions? I yes, sir. Have a question from the first part. Okay. The no open meeting law? No. The Public records or? The voting. Oh, the voting. On the same day registration. Yep. What happens if you get somebody coming in, you know they don't live in town, but they're going to vote it, they want to register anyway? Well, if you know they don't live in town, you don't have to register them. You don't have to. If you know they don't live in town. That, and again, that would be the town clerk and, the, and members of the BCA would make those decisions on election day. Would you go ahead and say no? I'm if you ahead. know they don't live in town. That's kind of contradicting what we get trained on because you have to, it doesn't matter, you take the registration. Well, you can take day, the registration. And then you have to deal with it after. That's. Well, but the, he's asking a specific point. If, he, if you don't know the person. Well, you obviously, we know everybody yeah. in town. Well, <laughs> it, I can go there. In victory, you would. <laughs> the situation would be in, in a small town like we have, you get one or two people that illegally registered who could throw off everything for town election. So then you'd be. So you're clarifying here. If we know they do not reside in our town, 
If you know they do not reside in your town, I, to you can, I would refuse them. If you know they don't reside. Okay, we all heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, the, the situation that you folks went through was a completely different situation. It wasn't the same as right. what. But I, but I think it will come up. Yes. You know, there, there are many different definitions of resident in statute, so that's probably what might hang you up. You say, you know, you reside in town. Well, what does that mean? Uh, do they permanently reside? Do they intend to reside? And there's been a whole bunch of court cases around that, as you're well aware. Mine. Yeah, of course. And it's not intent. It, it's not intent. No more intent. Yeah. Either wake up there every morning or you don't mm -hmm. So, any other questions? When was that, uh, you talked about seeing Russian IP addresses trying to access? August 2018. Was there like an investigation? Yeah, we, well we sent, the infor we sent our log information down to the Center for Internet Security and we sent it to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they requested some additional information from us. They checked with a few other states, found that those same IP addresses were showing up so they issued out a nationwide alert. So these are IP addresses that were contacting your servers. Uh, I guess the game access. They were picking us. They were scanning us, and we, and I mean, to put it in perspective, we get scanned thousands of times per day. Right. We're always being scanned. Um, we've got the systems in place to defend against that, to block that stuff, um, and but we actually have logs, we have monitors, so that we can see what's what's going on. Uh, me, did you say that that sort of all put in place after the 2016 election? Or were you working on we were, we were doing it before, um, here in Vermont. I would not say that about every state. I can't, I, I don't know what every state was doing, but I can tell you that today, since 2016, the states have been really focused on cybersecurity. And what kind of information if I got into or if someone got into the Secretary of State's server or database or whatever it is? It would be a, a listing of everybody in the state, every business, every professional. Well, as far as corporate registrations, um, anything that, if, if you file a corporate register, registration with us, everything you file is public. Right. So you can pull that information up. Right. We don't, we don't. So what would someone have to gain who's nefarious? Well, if they could get in and, and, and delete our voter registration database, uh, it, would create, it would create a problem for the town clerks if they, they got up to, on election day and there was nothing there. Um, so, uh, but we put it in place because we back it up every night. So we now have the capability of backing up 24 hours and, and reposting that, that database. Uh, and we would only lose 24 hours worth of, of information um, and we have other ways of people still being allowed to vote. Cool. So, all right, well, thank you very much. You. Oh, I'm sorry, did someone did? I, I came in late and I apologize. Um, you may have covered this, in fact, if I, if I, and or this might not be the right venue, but the question is this. Um, at least some town clerks in Vermont, if someone wants to go in and research some records and the town involved, there's a, a fee that gets charged. Is that something that's in state statute? Yes. That is in state statute. But are most all records in the vault? Well, it's, I mean, that's, that. generally it's the, the, the fee for vault fees, I don't know, what do you, is it just for land records or do you, for anything? It's for any reason. You know, each town, there, there's some of this, the towns can set up their own fee structure if, if they're not using the state's fee structure. But there are fees, like for instance, land records, vital records, um, which are embedded in statute. So essentially, there's legislation that enables the town clerk to set to charge a fee of four dollars so an hour. Yes. The state. Yes. So the state. And they can charge something different than that if they want to or not. Um, I, I, I don't think I don't know of any that does. Okay. But I suppose they could, if as long as the select board has uh, approved it. But. Is there a cap? Okay. Right, Anything else?
Thank you very much for coming Thank you. Thank you. on a snowy night.